And I will present the next speaker who will be presenting on greening camps and sites as a way of improving delivery of humanitarian uh, assistance. Uh, it's Charles Kelly, I believe uh, he's already ready. Voila, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not gonna show you my, my pretty face today because I have serious <laughs> bandwidth limitations. As a matter of fact, I may just disappear uh, sometime uh, this afternoon. But thanks for a chance to talk about uh, greeting camps and sites. Uh, I go by my last name, Kelly. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the Environment Community of Practice in the Global Shelter Cluster. Uh, and I've been looking at uh, environmental issues and, and humanitarian response for, for a number of years. Part of what I'm going to talk about today is an outcome of, of some work. Uh, I was collaborating with a number of other people in, uh, who are involved in site, site planning and site selection. Uh, and there was a series of uh, webinars, workshops uh, earlier this year. And one of the questions came up was greening camps. How do you go about doing that? So I'll give you a bit of perspective on that. So greening camps, what is it? Well, you can just paint it green maybe. But that's probably not what we're really talking about here. So we need to understand greening camps is, it's a concept. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's a policy uh, and for certain organizations, it's a very explicit policy uh, and it's a process. And this is very important and actually the key point here because it's almost never that we end up with a camp that was totally designed perfectly from the beginning. Uh, in most cases, a camp will evolve into a greener state over time, uh, whether it be a couple of months or, or several decades or something like that. And so that's what we're we need to think about, not necessarily the perfect camp that can be designed perfectly in the start, but uh, camps that um, evolve over time. And so here's a picture from 2016, I believe, um, near Mosul, and you, you have a, you wouldn't call it a greenfield site in the background, it's kind of a brownfield site. I presume the white things are actually the trains or showers. Uh, and then sort of interestingly, you got a bunch of cars. And so this whole issue about, well, you give people come into a site, you give them a tent and they're happy. Well, no, these people have cars, they have possessions, uh, a lot of stuff like that. And this is all what we need to consider in terms of greening uh, a camp or a site. Now in terms of policy, for all of those of you who are associated with the United Nations, um, we have something called greening the blue. And it, organization, it's a UN-wide policy to green the blue, sort of obviously, I guess is the case. Uh, there's a, there's a, I seem to have been disconnected. Let me come back. Back now. Sorry we, about that, folks. We lost you for the last uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, well, so we're talking about greening the blue. As I said, connection is not so good. Uh, so the UN system needs to pay attention to its peacekeeping operations and done some nice stuff. Uh, a lot of organizations are coming up with carbon neutral policies, very strict ones, a little bit less strict ones. And these are trickling down slowly to the field in terms of cutting back travel and, and other kinds of things. There's sort of a lot of questions being raised about that. Uh, a lot of organizations are looking at sustainable operations or from their development side, sustainable development. Uh, and this has been a, something around for, for many uh, decades now. Sustainable operations, it's a bit, you know, if you have a camp, you don't want it to be sustainable. You kind of want it to go out of existence. And so there's some tussling back and forth in the concepts here of what is a sustainable response and what is sustainability and things like that. Uh, but still organizations and people are talking about that. Uh, other organizations and, and some of the same organizations are talking about envir integrating environmental policies into their humanitarian response or, or their um, site, site selection and site planning kind of response. And here we have, and we, earlier today, we had some presentations on NEAT uh, and, and it's used in urban areas and, and a number of other things. So 
presentation on, on uh, drainage in a camp. So all these aspects are bringing environment into the actual operation. And sometimes it may be an explicit policy and sometimes it may be not. Donor policy is very important. Um, increasingly donors are looking at environmental reviews and what are called environmental management and monitoring plans. Um, and different organizations, different donors have different criteria here and they apply them differently. But generally, if you have a camp that's been in existence for four or five years, uh, you can't say that it's an emergency situation. It's a static situation. And the donor may come along and say, well, you need to start review reviewing environmental conditions there. And there's some like USAID that are more proactive on that and, and other organizations that are less. One of the outcomes of that process is called an environmental management and monitoring plan. So the environmental management part of that plan is to figure out how to improve your management of the site. And that's what we're talking about greening. There's also the aspect of conflict sensitive programming. Uh, you put a, a site's created, people go out, outside the site, start collecting wood, you got a problem. Uh, so looking at content, conflict and the sensitivity issues around that often is part and parcel of an environmental approach. And then you have uh, gender-based violence. Again, the issue of people moving outside the site and searching for natural resources and often can create a violent a situation of violence and particularly towards one gender or another. And this is another aspect of, of the environment that we need to come into understanding how to green a site. Now, also, I want to mention the, the IFRC, uh, Inter International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, is also pushing uh, to, to green their own operations. And then the final thing, which I think was maybe covered earlier today, uh, will be covered is the humanitarian circular economy uh, and the idea that resources going into a humanitarian situation should operate in a circular fashion and then come out of the humanitarian operation and nothing be left to waste there. And this is sort of an emerging idea, but it, it's quite interesting. So greening as a practice, and I'll just go through this quickly uh, because most of you I'm sure are already aware of a lot of these things. So we have energy, everything from sto stoves to solar grids. Solar grids are usually not installed in the third day of a camp existence. Usually it's three rocks and a piece of wood as your heating source and it moves forward from there. So it's an incremental process. And there've been some very good examples in, in, in Jordan, but also in, in uh, East Africa of coming in with solar grids and, and setting them up in sites and using even a public pri private partnership option. And uh, some of the donors are very interested in that. Uh, waste management, um, reuse, repurpose, redirect. And I can't see what the last one says because there's some people in the way. Uh, redirect and recycle. Uh, all these things are all part of the waste management process. And the idea essentially is not to have any waste left over. Most camps and sites don't have much waste to start with, uh, but the older they get, the more waste they have. And you need to figure out a way to manage that rather than becoming a problem. And a lot of the opportunities, as we've heard in earlier presentations today, a lot of the opportunities to manage that waste um, have a very strong environmental component. Site management overall. Very good presentation earlier this morning on uh, flood management within sites. Uh, so flooding, drainage, fire risk. Why is fire a uh, environmental issue? Well, if your camp burns down, you're using twice as many resources as you would use if you didn't burn down. So fire management, space, paths, all those things. And I'll give an example on that in a minute. Transport. The displaced do have cars or donkeys or cattle or herds of camels or something. So thinking about transport as part of the overall site uh, operation is quite important. The buildings, there's a lot on materials and, and, and the sustainability of sources. Uh, their UNHCR has been looking at uh, quantifying the carbon involved, uh, uh, embedded carbon in, in shelter options. Uh, the Joint Environment, uh, the, I'm sorry, the uh, Environmental Community Practice and World Wildlife Fund and, and BRE are also looking at a tool to do that. Walls and enclosures. Basic point is if you have a three meter high a uh, 40 centimeter thick mud wall around your compound for security, where did that mud come from? And it probably came from somebody's field and they're probably pretty pissed off about it. So you need to think about these things before they do this. And this is an example that happened in Darfur as a fact. Wash, I could go on forever on wash, water, sanitation, uh, and hygiene. There are many areas that you can enter there. You can look there for greening. And livelihoods, very important. People, as somebody said earlier, uh, within a couple of days, somebody's gonna be selling tomatoes or something like that. Um, lots of livelihoods going on in camp. The longer it exists, the more li livelihoods. They're taking energy, they're producing waste. Uh, they're having a lot of other impacts and these things need to be incorporated in, into the management plan. Now here's a little example and I'm using this without any prejudice to any organization, site or uh, 
the people involved. Uh, this is actually from a, a site in a, a, one of the camps in Bangladesh, a little sort of cesspoolic like body of water there, kind of precarious passageway, uh, dangerous at night, obviously, even during the day, during the raining season, it might be even worse. And then you come up with a solution. Now, I'm not going to say it's the same place, but I'm talking about the solution here. So you have a nice solution. You put in it that you put dirt in bags locally. You can see locally, and, and then you put the bags up, stabilize the the pathway, put a little nice little bridge across, and it's all going to be much safer day or night. Uh, when it rains, when it doesn't rain, it's all really good. Except somebody decided to use uh, woven plastic bags. They decompose in six months in sunlight, which means even without all the foot traffic on some of the bags, they're going to start falling apart fairly quickly. Um, and in this case, in Bangladesh, they have jute bags. And so the question would be, why we, didn't they use jute as opposed to these plastic bags? The answer, the quick answer was apparently that the plastic bags were cheaper. Uh, but this is part of the thinking you need to go into in terms of greening operations. Cheap may not be the greenest op option. You need to think through those things. And I apologize for using one organization as an example here. So barriers, cost, as I just gave the example, the immediate cost may be less or the immediate cost may be higher than, than another option and you need to argue more the long term. Like if you have to replace the bags three times in the next uh, 18 months as opposed to just buying one bag once, you know, the cost is going to be better. A little bit of cost benefit analysis. Inflexibility, the donor, the boss, the project. Um, yeah, we're all told we have to do certain things certain ways. Uh, what we found actually is that people are really innovative <laughs> and they're figuring out ways around the donor, not necessarily around the donor, but, you know, dealing with the donor and the boss and the project in a way that does things good, that's good. So uh, don't get in trouble saying Kelly told you to do that, but think innovative. We had a presentation on that already. Time and resources. Fixing one stream crossing is one thing. Fixing a whole camp is going to take time and resources. So think about that. It's not it's a nice idea to fix one thing, but you really want to think big if you have to and think about what the time and resources you're going to need. And then the final challenge, the final barrier often is the fact that that sites are seen as temporary. Um, and, you know, so they don't want anything permanent or sustainable done. So you have to argue for things that might be uh, able to take them down after you're finished or that they're only a temporary improvement or something like that. Um, but also take into account that some, some sites have been around for, for uh, 40 years. And so there is a process at some point saying, look, we're going to be here for the next two years. We might as well do some things to improve the conditions. So these are a quick list of things um, to apply the concept. So all things are environmental. Uh, there, is nothing, there is nothing in a camp uh, or a site that is not environmental, one way or the other. Uh, you want to use the environment to your advantage. Think about it. How can we drain this area uh, in a safe way? How can we put these houses or these tents in a place that doesn't end up with a problem? Uh, how can we use the landscape in a way that uh, improves the environmental amenities and reduces the, the, the negative impacts? Uh, you want to incorporate environment-based site planning into the planning process, no matter which period of time you're doing it. So whether it's the first week, the first month, or the first year, you want to look at things from an environmental uh, perspective. And there is guidance uh, on that, and I'll share that at the end of the presentation. You want to consider environmental amenities? Yes, planting trees or having having shade, not necessarily planting trees, but having shade is nice for the people in the camp, and they may be happy about that, which reduces one of your other problems you might be dealing with. Uh, look for environmental-based solutions. Uh, sites, as I said before, are often an incremental uh, development process, so you have opportunities over time to improve them and the environmental uh, conditions in them. You want to look, as I said before, at how people are making a living and how that option for making a living evolves over time. So at one point, everything may be looking good. And three months later, you find people are burning tires to get the, the, the wiring out of them to, to sell. You know, it's an evolving process. You want to look at long-term implications. If you start pouring concrete in a camp, it's going to be around for a long time. Maybe there are other things you can do in the camp uh, that other ways you can attack problems in the camp that, that are not like pouring concrete. And then finally, clean up after yourself. Uh, we've seen too many sites where people are everywhere left, and then you end up with unfilled latrines, you end up with all sorts of dangerous stuff sitting around, and it looks like a, it looks like a, a really bad place. And remember, there is a commitment to the communities to return the site to the status that it was at least as good 
as before you left. And there have been some good examples of this. Um, and I think in the, the shelter sector has collected some examples of this, of how sites can be turned back into fields or turned back into parks or, or, or return to a much better condition than you left. But don't leave them as a mess because kids will get in there, they'll fall in the latrines and they'll die. I mean, it, it really is not a good idea to do it that way. Good, so that was a quick overview of graining camps and sites. Uh, if you want any more uh, guidance, a set of key references uh, that we put together, humanitarian shelter sites and the environment key references, I will send it to you. I will not charge you for it too. So no shipping involved. You just send me an email at havedisastercallkelly at gmail.com and I'll send that to you. And uh, I guess we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, participants, if you want to write your questions in the chat. Kelly, maybe um, I can ask you something while we have you here. And by the way, thank you so much for, for joining uh, this cluster. Um, but I mean, I wondered also like, I mean, you mentioned like different range of, you know, concerns and issues in a camp that is related to environmental um, issues. Do you think we also have potentially a role to play for, you know, like introducing different or greener kind of practices for communities for when they're able to leave camps? I mean, like capacity building, awareness raising, you know, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's that's all possible. And actually are good ideas because if you have people in camps, in many cases, they don't have a lot to do with their spare time. And so training people in techniques to make, um, uh, like soil stable, uh, cement stabilized blocks or other kinds of techniques and methods that can be used environmentally. There are some examples of that having been done, but one of the frank challenges we face is that there's a, there has been over the years a lot of uh, innovation, but we don't have a good repertoire or compendium of all of that kind of in innovation going on. So I know I think in, in Nepal or, or um, someplace in that part of the world, there had been some programs that were training people on doing things greener things, skills that they would develop and then take that back to their communities when they went when they went home. And many of those skills can be used locally as well uh, in the camp. So uh, there are all sorts of possibilities there. I mean, one thing I saw in the presentation earlier uh, about draining site, site draining in Nigeria, you know, training people on how to figure out how to drain their sites. Uh, when they go back to their own village or they go to a new place, they're going to end up with the same problem. And so getting people involved in that process, it's a bit developmental in some ways, but it's still good practice and good learning that can take place. Yeah, so Joe asked a very interesting question as usual. Um, the definition of greening is something that is a little bit not fixed down. Uh, we've had discussions about is it is it uh, carbon embedded carbon or is it carbon just carbon used in products and and is it energy or is it carbon or back and forth. So there are a lot of aspects of that 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 the definitions haven't reached the, a practical level, frankly. Um, so when we talk about less carbon, what do we mean? Does that mean less steel or less cement or less carbon put in the atmosphere from cars driving around or less airplanes flying around and things like that? We can measure those things, but we really don't know which is the more important and which is the more, more useful in terms of where we, where we put our finger on things uh, and try to reduce them. And this is the, the tool that's being developed by Bree um, and WWF will also be helpful um, in trying to judge those things and, and UNHCR is doing that as well. But I think the practical measure, the practical aspect is you're in a site and you see lots of waste. You go, well, where's this waste coming from? You know, We just need to start dealing with the things we see in a sense of low hanging fruits and then move on from there. And, and there are a lot of opportunities. And I think in the Rohingya camps, uh, there've been a number of opportunities that have, that have uh, uh, developed over time in terms of improving the, the local environment. It will not be made into a perfect park uh, it's a camp. It's, it's a refugee camp or it's a, people displaced from a disaster. Most people won't want to be there the longer they stay there. So we just need to keep that in mind, but try the low-hanging fruit is the best way to deal with it. 
So Joe, Joe asked the question, is, is it carbon? No. Well, it could be or it could not be. It, it's really a good point to, to sit around the table and argue about those points. What we're looking at is trying to reduce the negative environmental impact and use the environment to, to develop a positive impact. So, yeah, um, yeah Amelia, you raised a question about waste management. There actually is quite a lot of guidance about that, but it's, it's always the poor child in the response is waste management. Um, and figuring out a way to put value to waste, whether turning it into insulation or other kinds of things, when those systems start getting put in place, usually a couple of months, six months, or a year after a, a site has been established, uh, they turn out to be quite productive. And, and we have examples, of course, of uh, waste being collected and turned into fuel briquettes and things like that, and, and a, an economy developed around waste. Um, uh, so um, it's an incremental process. And, yeah. Thank you. There is also a question from Jorn on what initial interventions have the best impact? Uh, it depends on the disaster. <laughs> uh, I, you know, the first thing to look at, I, if I were to go to a site, is the first thing to look at is how is the site interacting with, with the environment? Um, exactly the case that we saw a little while ago for Somalia is, are there people living in, on, at the bottom of hills where it's sandy and, and likely to flood? You know, it's, and, and there's an example from uh, Bangladesh, the Rohingya camps, a uh, colleague of mine, she showed a picture and said, what's the obvious problem here? And the problem was you had all these people living in front of a big forest in the distance. It's like they've moved into a forest. And of course they had elephants and, and uh, landslides and erosion problems and flooding problems. So that first look at the site, um, it can tell you a lot about what needs to be done. And what's encouraging is in this day and age, you have satellites, you have people like REACH and a lot of others, UNSAT, who can give you a lot of advice about uh, how to manage the environment, what, what things you need to address in terms of natural hazards, for instance, and that can lead you down a path of trying to improve the environmental conditions. Very rarely will it be a perfect site to start with, uh, but what you wanna do is incre incrementally improve the site over time so that, that it's less damaging to the environment, but it's also better for the people living in the site. There's one more comment from uh, from Joseph saying that uh, to, he agrees with uh, we need to mitigate all environmental impacts, but also need to be aware of timely life saving assistance as priority. Um, that's that's always the case. Life saving is the priority, but what we need to recognize is that these are not opposing things. It's not I'm going to hug the tree until these people die kind of situation. It's like, if you have to cut down the tree, cut down the tree, but figure out what you're going to do afterwards. So it's that thinking ahead process, which is oftentimes limited in, or lacking in humanitarian response. And set, somebody comes in and decides to set up a camp. I had this happen to me in Haiti where somebody decided to set up a camp. And we looked at it and said, you know, that's not really a good place. And they said, it's, it's done. Deal with it. And so we had to deal with it. So that's the kind of reality you have. And so it's not a competition between the environment and, and life-saving. Uh, the two things are linked together. If the people die, then the environment is at a loss. Thank you. Um, I see another question from, uh, from James on the two, three quick questions um, you could ask from the onset of an emergency crisis in CAM and CAM lane settings that you would say is the key to understand and consider from an environmental lens, which, this, which these questions would be? Uh, well, the first question is, has anybody done an assessment? <laughs> so you understand, I mean, if it's, if, for instance, if it's a bunch of herders that have been moved into a camp, then you got herding issues you have to deal with. If, if it's a bunch of farmers, you got farming issues. So the first question is, is there, assess, is there an assessment? Because then that will help tell you what the site is about. The second is, can we get any additional information about the site? Again, in the Rohingya site, it was in the middle of a forest where there are elephants. Obviously, elephants are going to be a problem. Now, that's not to say that you're going to be in a state where you're prioritizing issues, but you're just searching them out. And then, of course, try to use something like Neat Plus or a couple of other tools that are available to start collecting the information and getting advice about what you need to do about it. You never, almost never will have a site where you'll do an environmental review before the site is established. It's an ongoing process. And that's what you just have to keep asking those ongoing questions that sort of ongoing, you have to keep asking the questions as you go through. Now, I would say that that through the CCCM cluster, the shelter cluster, World Wildlife Fund, um, and a number of other ways, the Joint Environment Unit at, at, in 
uh, Geneva, we can get you advice in a matter of 24 hours. And we've done this a lot for the, the shelter cluster. We can get you advice on any problem you have. We can't necessarily fix it for you, <laughs> but we can give you advice about where to go. So if you're in a site and all of a sudden you have a question like, how do I do draining or what do I do? Send us an email, you can use my email address uh, or there are other email addresses you can reach out to um, and we can help you um, uh, at least start the process of, of solving your, your the challenges you face. And yes, Joe did show the, has the great elephant maps, the elephant. Well, also you should go find the picture of the, of the dancing elephants, IUCN. Um, uh, IUCN has some uh, really good pictures of dancing elephants as well. Something to think about. Good. Cool. Lunch time, right? Yeah, let's uh, wait a few more seconds in case there's one last minute question from participants. Um, in the meanwhile, I will mention that uh, lots of the, the questions and points that we discussed in this last presentation are related to a site environment. So we will have a session next Tuesday um, in the afternoon, like uh, the regular uh, retreat session. So um, all of you join that for further discussion. So I don't see more questions coming in. So I think that perhaps we're tired than some of us hungry. So I think we can wrap it up here if there's no other questions. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, for this presentation and all the, all the speakers and for all the participants. Um, we will be back at 1.15. Uh, so time to uh, get your lunch, uh, stretch your legs and uh, get more coffee. Uh, thank you very much. And then I will hand over the focal point to Jennifer from uh, 1.15. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.